Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Caprin. Uh, today I want to talk about ends, not endings as in finishes, but ends as in goals, purposes, and intents. Ends and means. What are the means you will use to achieve your ends? And since it is Epiphany, we will use the three wise men as our example. These uh, characters described in Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12, um, are sometimes called kings, sometimes wise men. Magi is probably the best translation. Astrologers from the east, from Persia, presumably from modern day Iran. So what's the deal with these three? Well, they were scholars. They were spiritual people. And they were well enough off that they could take a journey of several months without worrying about starvation or bankruptcy. Did they travel light, just the three of them? Or did they have an entourage of servants and wives, etc.? They are usually depicted with camels, uh, but no camels are mentioned in the Bible, so who knows? Maybe horses. They were deemed important enough to be welcomed into Herod's palace in Jerusalem. Uh, they seemed, however, a bit naive about the politics of Palestine and are easily manipulated by Herod, who sends them off to Bethlehem with a request that they let him know exactly what they find so that Herod, too, may uh, uh, ahem, go and worship the new king who's not Herod, um, by which Herod means murder him. Um, he was just that kind of guy. And there comes a moment when our three travelers are overjoyed. One commentator puts it this way. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It is impossible to over-translate the strength of this reaction. What gives them all this joy? It actually isn't Jesus. It is when they find the star they have been following settled at Bethlehem. I'm not sure what to make of that. Perhaps they felt their journey was vindicated, or maybe they had a little ego moment, or perhaps they were overcome by the wonder of the world. But they went in, and they worshipped little King Jesus, the ruler in the manger, and they gave him gifts fit for a king. No doubt they shared some kind words with Mary and Joseph, and then they did this really interesting thing. They went home. They came all this way, they found the Holy King, they worshipped him who is the Savior of us all, and then they went home. Why didn't they stay? Those of us who live centuries after Jesus probably think to ourselves, oh, if I had met Jesus face to face in the flesh, I would never leave him. And maybe that's true. But if you read the Gospels, it is a small number who actually do that. Sure, there are some great stories about Peter and Andrew leaving their boats immediately to follow Jesus. Similarly, Nathaniel and Matthew, who vacates his tax collecting booth. They leave everything behind to remain with Jesus as apostles. But most people Jesus meets don't do that. Zacchaeus doesn't. Formerly blind Bartimaeus doesn't. The Syrophoenician woman whose bleeding is healed when she touches Jesus' cloak, doesn't. The woman caught in adultery that Jesus saved from being stoned to death, doesn't. Nicodemus doesn't. The Roman centurion doesn't. Jairus, the synagogue leader whose daughter Jesus raised from the dead, doesn't. The Samaritan woman at the well, doesn't. All these people have profound encounters with Jesus. One could generally consider they have been saved. They have met Jesus, and in their own ways, they have recognized and accepted him. And yet, they go back to their regular lives. It wasn't their purpose to stay. And as one who strongly believes in the sovereignty of God, I would have to say that it probably wasn't God's purpose for them to stay either. In other words, it was okay for them to go back to their lives. For the overwhelming majority of us, God calls us to be faithful in the context of our ordinary lives. God has planted you where you are. God wants you to be a faithful disciple in your little corner of the world. You are the domain expert on your own life, and God wants you to find ways to show God's love to those around you there. And I know so many of you uh, that are 
are doing that, and that assurance makes me both happy and proud. But how do we know if we're fulfilling God's purpose? How do we know if we are achieving the ends that God has laid out for us? I looked up the word for ends in the Bible and was surprised that it was the Greek word telos. For a Bible nerd like me, that is an exciting discovery. Telos is a really interesting word, and we're going to take a look at its uh, definitions and use in some Bible verses. But the core of it is that one does just what we've been talking about. One fulfills God's purpose for one's life. All right, here we go in, in reverse order from my Greek to English dictionary. Um, definitions for telos. The last in a succession or series. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Jesus. He's the first and the last. He's everything in between. And at the final end, telos. An aim or purpose of a thing. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of pure doctrine is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The utmost degree of an act. John 13.1, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to his Father. A fulfillment. Luke twenty two thirty seven, I tell you this, says Jesus, all scripture must be fulfilled in me. The final issue or a result of a state or process. 1 Peter 1, 9, you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And finally, the limit at which a person or thing ceases to be what he or she or it was up until that point, or at which previous activities were ceased. So this includes transformation in the definition. And, and here's an example, 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. Do you see how this notion of ends and purpose come together in this word telos. Well, thank you for indulging me in that moment with an important word. And let me try and pull all of this together now. The three magi from the east sensed that their journey was over after they followed the star to find Jesus. They had fulfilled their telos, their purpose. It is nice when there is a concrete way to know that that has happened. It's not always so clear, though. So how do you know when you're done, when you've achieved the proper end of a thing? To be indelicate, one way is you know the business of life is concluded when you die, or also if you are completely unable to continue for some reason. Our congregation supports some missionaries uh, who worked with the Kurds in the Middle East, and they had to stop their work in 2019 when this U.S. suddenly pulled all its forces and Turkey invaded. The situation was not safe for them to continue, and they had to leave the area and modify their ministry. They are now based in Germany and have to continue by working more remotely, training and helping others to do the direct work. Another way you know you are done is when you are clearly called to some new work. My wife, Lynn, is having her first Sunday with her new church in Elmira. The call to Elmira was part of the confirmation she had that her work in Verona was done. Perhaps the three wise men had some important godly work to do back Perhaps God simply calls us to a different place or simply to a different church to fulfill some purpose of God. Um, many people in my congregation in Elmwood Park um, have come from another church, and uh, that is their, their knowledge and what they brought with them has been a blessing to us here. And we're taking a pretty serious look at our future and are starting to proceed with some intention that perhaps 2023 um, will be the last uh, year of our life together as a church, 
and that we will all wind up going to some other church after that. And we're looking for God's guidance in that. But it's very sad to me when people do not follow through in seeking God's purposes and opportunities. Here's an excerpt from an email I got yesterday that made me quite sad. It is from a man I like and respect, who was a leader in one of the churches I served many years ago. He wrote, I am pleased that Lynn has been called to Elmira. You're not really that far away. We might be tempted to stop in some Sunday. We haven't found a church home since moving away from our hometown. I was getting pretty fed up with the antics of a few of the folks there, and we just haven't made any real friends in our new town. I don't know anyone's heart and soul, of course, but this kind of talk makes me very uneasy. I've moved around a lot, and I've always been able to find a church I like. Our calling is to worship God in community. This time on Sundays is not for us. It is for God. We are responding to God's call, and in the words of our tradition, that call is to know and enjoy God forever. So to not go to church, and perhaps to ground that lack in complaints about other people and churches, puts one on very dangerous spiritual ground, where one might tragically miss God's telos, or God's purpose. If my friend happens to hear this sermon someday, I urge him to be in serious prayer about this matter. Now this is the point in the sermon where I pause and ask myself, what is the good news of the gospel in this sermon? This week, the answer is that God has a plan for the redemption of the world. God has chosen an instrument for helping to work out this plan, and that instrument is the church, capital C, church universal in the world. In Elmwood Park, we are one branch office of that church and are working to fulfill God's purpose. But we are in a unique situation at the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park because we are seeing that perhaps it is time to close this branch in 2023 to and that to fulfill God's plans, we need to adapt, change, and seek a purpose in some other branch offices. To start talking about that, I will spend the next six weeks talking about something from our Presbyterian Book of Order called The Great Ends of the Church. My hope is that this will stimulate our thinking about the future as we seek to be faithful in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. That is what the wise people of old did from those three who followed the star. It is also what Joseph and Mary did, what the apostles did, and of course, Jesus himself. As long as we follow in their footsteps, we will do well. Now, how can we know that? because we will also be following God's purposes and seeking to advance God's ends. And my friends, you can be sure of this. God loves us and has saved us. Amen.